with the editor is proudly brought to you by IRZ and the Railway Safety Regulator, RSR. It's nice to be at your office and not in our usual um, coffee shop. Uh, you released, I think it was last week, um, a press release with regards to Oakley South Africa's rail network. Um, just contextualise your thoughts behind that. Thanks, Philip. It's great to have you here. So, our response, um, our press release is really a response to the um, discussion document of the National Treasury released um, and included in, the, in that suite of proposals was a proposal that private operators are allowed access to the core network in South Africa. And it also follows on from the national, uh, the, the draft white paper international rail policy, which also calls for uh, private operators having access to the, to the core network. And the reason we felt it necessary to put to put out is that there are a huge number of stakeholders in our industry and for those stakeholders and it's important that those stakeholders understand that if government does roll out this policy firstly there is a company in the form of traction that is hugely supportive of what government wants to do and secondly if government does roll it out that we would respond with significant investment into the sector and we felt that if we didn't add our voice um, to those that are talking about uh, the, the policy proposals of government. That it, there would be a risk that it's a policy that government doesn't see the benefit of actually implementing. So I think some of the standout points um, for me would be really what the impacts of opening the network would be. Um, and you've mentioned some things like um, you know, unlocking job creation, stimulating economic growth, you, you highlighted specific sectors such as agricultural, heavy industry and mining. I mean, what is your thoughts on, on that? So, like our primary thought on that is that we spend a lot of time in the rail industry talking about how many jobs we create in the rail industry. But really, we are part of a nation's infrastructure matrix. And a nation's infrastructure exists to make that country internationally competitive. And when countries are internationally competitive, their economies thrive, and those economies create jobs. So while there is a clear benefit of this policy in creating direct jobs in the rail industry, the really, really exciting opportunity that we see for South Africa through this policy is unlocking upstream job creation um, opportunities and in a really quick time period we think unlocking potential economic growth at a time when our country desperately desperately needs it. So you mentioned um, a couple of things like smelters and would, would that enable us to put down you know, new industry and, and develop and expand some of the industrial capacity that we do have? Yes absolutely and, and that's you know, the sort of fundamental reason why countries invest in the infrastructure. And, you know, the, South Africa is in an amazing, amazingly privileged position, okay? We've got about 36,000 kilometers of installed rail track. Transnet on their own have about 23,000 route kilometers. To replace our rail network from scratch today, we think would cost about one and a half trillion rand. But we don't have to incur that expense because we've got it installed already. Kenya have just spent $3.2 billion on a 458km railway line. Now why did Kenya invest that money? Because they want to unlock the competitiveness of their economy through a highly efficient logistics solution between Nairobi and their main port, Mombasa. In South Africa, we have it installed already. But that network has excess capacity, and that ex excess capacity is lying latent mm. in the network. And where you've got latent capacity, that is a revenue generating opportunity for that infrastructure owner. Mm. It's a little bit like building a toll road and then only letting certain people drive on the toll road and not others. You're leaving um, opportunities out there available where you could be 
uh, creating toll fees. So we see this as an opportunity because that is not one and a half trillion rand that our government needs to go and spend. It's an opportunity that is already there, um, that it can be turned on very quickly. And that for us is the truly exciting uh, aspect of this regulatory change that government is looking at rolling out. So from a trans transnet perspective, I mean, I don't really see this having an adverse impact opening the network. I think it would be profitable for them. That's exactly right. And, you know, we feel that Transnet have, have somewhat unfairly taken quite a lot of pressure from uh, the broader, from government and from South Africans for not utilizing all the capacity in our network. But the bottom line is that we don't think there's any company in the world that would be able to take up the extent of the capacity in our network. Transnet is doing some amazing things. But there comes a point where every company runs out of its ability to raise the capital to continue to expand. Capital, uh, capital investment is funded by uh, equity, by debt, and by cash generated from the operations. And that is a ceiling for all, country, all companies. And where that, where that, where the, where the, the, the only company with access to our core network doesn't have the capacity to continue to expand, to take up all of the opportunities that there are to move freight in the country, well then it becomes, we think, a no-brainer to open that capacity up to third-party, competent and safe operators. And when you do that, when the, and when the volumes that we're targeting are purely incremental to transmit, and that is exactly what the case would be, 100% incremental to the existing volumes that are running, then you generate access fees for them, and you bring volumes back to the rail industry. So what, are those, what makes up that volume? You know, we've been talking road to rail and you know, how, how much of the traffic we are or are not moving, uh, containerized traffic, so we are or are not moving on the rail. I mean, where, would you, where would a company like Traction or any other private operator find those, that volume? If we think that there is, um, there are opportunities to bring volumes to rail in a broad, in, in, across the industry. Okay, so you rightly rise, raise the containerized um, freight that has um, where road has a huge dominance in South Africa, and and we we certainly believe that there is an opportunity there. We believe that there's a huge opportunity in agriculture um, to bring those volumes to rail. We believe that there's a big opportunity in uh, heavy industries um, to bring those volumes to to rail as well. Um, and then, of course, uh, in the mining sector, there's opportunities as well. And we do not see any opportunities to bring additional capacity at the moment to the coal and iron ore sectors, for example. Those sectors are extremely well serviced by Transnet, where they are doing some really amazing stuff. But we see the opportunities um, outside of those sectors. Um, we also see the opportunities in mining, in potentially unlocking new mining opportunities that to date haven't been exploited. Um, so we really do see a, a, the opportunities in, 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 to bring volumes from road to rail and abroad uh, across the economy. You know, one of the opportunities that is often mentioned is the branch lines. There are certainly opportunities in the branch lines, but the issue with the branch lines is that in order to bring um, rail logistics solutions to the branch lines, those trains do need to run, we believe, to the ultimate destination, which means that branch line operator would also need access to the core network. There is a huge opportunity um, across a number of sectors to bring volumes um, into onto the onto the network and take up some of that latent capacity that is that does sit in our network. Mining opportunities, and that would obviously be like internal mining operations, and then connecting it, um, connecting that mine to the core network. Mm -hmm. And some of that could be like a 200 kilometer line, and some of that could be a 50 kilometer line. In a, in a monetary term, what are the opportunities that we're losing by not unlocking those, those mines? So, you know, I guess that's the million dollar question, and, and no, nobody really knows what um, economic growth has been hindered um, in the past by not being able to take up the full capacity that our rail network has available. Um, so it's, it's a very difficult answer to, to, to give you. All that we do know is that if you look at the size of the South African economy, 
um, versus the size of the economies um, in many other African countries. Um, and you look at the extent to which um, South Africa has a huge thriving network. Um, you know, Transnet moving 220 million tons is a massive railway, one of the world's biggest and most successful railways. Okay? It talks to a big economy that we have in South Africa. And on the outskirts of that, we have absolutely no doubt that there are significant opportunities to bring volumes off our roads onto the railway, particularly in areas that are perfectly suited um, to rail and, and in areas where, in the rest of the world, those volumes move um, on the railways. So you've raised that it's you know, part of national treasury, it's a discussion document, it's in the draft um, white paper for transport. Why do you think Transnet hasn't quite taken the leap yet? I don't think they've had any regulatory direction from government um, on this in the past. You know, the, what, what the draft white paper international rail policy is calling for is the vertical separation between infrastructure and operations. And we do think that that follows from international best practice, and we do think that ultimately it's the right way to go. The, problem, the only issue that we see with that is it's going to be complex and it's going to be very time consuming to, to separate um, that, uh, the infrastructure out of um, a, a consolidated rail operation, which is Transnet at the moment. So we do see that to be a timely, um, something that's going to take some time. Okay. On the other hand, our understanding is that Transnet does have the ability at the moment to sign access agreements under their existing rail safety regulator permit and to bring operators onto the core network. So we do think that um, the opportunity here is a two-phased opportunity. The first opportunity would be to enter into access agreements together with Transnet, who would be infrastructure owner and operator, um, and, op um, and operate complementary to Transnet, bringing volumes um, in addition to the volumes that they have now. And then in future, once um, the infrastructure owner has been set up, much like Network Rail in the United Kingdom, um, that we would then have an infrastructure owner with um, Transnet being certainly the most dominant operator in the network or the biggest operator um, in the country, but having various other operators operating alongside Transnet in the future. That would also require everything to be scheduled and planned. Absolutely, but again, you know, we have a huge amount of confidence in Transnet's ability to actually roll this out. Um, you know, Transnet um, run an integrated management system, so they have ISO certification across their network, as far as I understand it, for example. Um, their safety standards are extremely high. Um, you know, so when you look at the capabilities within Transnet, they, they, they're really strong. Um, the quality of the network itself, the actual track conditions, are really good. Um, um, certainly in, in comparison to, to what you find in, 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 in the region in, in certain areas. So you know, there's, there's a number of reasons why we believe that it should be something that can be achieved and something that can be really, really successful. Uh, you brought up the rail uh, safety regulator. Um, how would they? What role would they fulfil? Well, obviously, their role is safety, but I mean, would there be a broader aspect to their role now if we open the network? So my, my understanding is that um, Transit would sign access. Uh, Transit are in their rights to sign access agreements under their existing um, safety permit. Um, so it would be up to Transnet then to regulate. Um, how those private operators operate under their permit. Okay? So it wouldn't necessarily require um, the rail safety regulator to provide permits to the private operators that are looking to enter the network. Those private operators would operate under Transnet's permit. Now, to be very clear, this is our understanding of the existing situation. Um, in future, once we have a state owned enterprise that is, um, that is, is responsible, um, as the infrastructure owner, well then, at that stage, when you have a number of operators um, operating under the, um, on that network, on behalf of that state-owned company, then Transnet would require a permit and um, hopefully companies like ourselves at that stage would require our permits on our own. At the moment, our understanding of the regulation, and we obviously have looked into it, um, is that we would operate under Transnet's permit. Open access networks, um, they do exist in Africa, some quite successfully. Yes, so if you look at a number of our regional, part, uh, our regional partner countries, they are going into those um, in this direction. 
uh, Mozambique, Zambia, and Tanzania, for example, have already um, implemented um, third-party operators onto the network with enormous success, um, and uh, and there have been incremental uh, jumps in the extent to which rail volumes are moved in those countries. So you know the fact that we are going, we following our government has decided to follow a policy network that follows not only international best practice but follows what our regional partners are doing is also really encouraging. Of course, what it also means is that it enhances the interconnectivity inter between South Africa and our regional trading partners. Now, one of the biggest frustrations of um, industry in South Africa is the high cost of logistics of getting um, our manufactured goods into the region. Highly efficient rail networks that are operating um, into the region um, can surely only be positive for South African industry and manufacturing as we attempt to get our goods into the region uh, in a highly efficient manner. In, in President Robert Pauza's um, uh, weekly newsletter that he released this morning, he talks exactly about that same thing, about South Africa's future lies in trading with the continent. And that's absolutely right. In order to do that, we need a highly efficient logistics network to get our parts and our, um, our industry to be successful in the region. And we think that an interconnected rail system um, with um, operators that can operate across the network makes a huge amount of sense. And that's obviously where it's going if we have um, an open access arrangement across the region. So traction, you've got rolling stock, you've got a projects section, you have money. Um, let's say we signed it off today, what would you be doing tomorrow? So, you know, I guess everything that we've done in, in, in many ways is get ourselves to be able to become a significant rail operator in the region. Um, our leasing company has huge funding capacity because of the nature of our institutional shareholders. The, um, we're at the, we have 32 years of experience in operations. We have ISO certification ourselves, and the equivalent of no so five star safety ratings, etc. So, you know, we believe that there are a couple of things needed in order to be able to make a company successful. Um, under a policy like this. Uh, the first is you need to be competent and safe. And we do think that we have the capabilities, the capacity to be able to, to, to make a significant investment um, in the sector from that direction in terms of are we a competent and safe operator? Yes, I really think we are. The next question is do you have the funding capacity to bring the huge investments that are needed in order to make a real difference? Because you know, each locomotive costs three um, and a half million dollars to four million dollars. Each wagon costs somewhere between sixty thousand and one hundred and twenty thousand dollars. So, in order to make a significant difference, you need to have a huge access to capital. Um, a a company that has the ability to put on one or two train sets is not going to make this policy really make sense. It has to be operators with the ability to bring significant investments in the sector, and and we do think. That, that is um, where we can respond, is that we have, um, thankfully, significant access to capital.